Uh, so Miles said I couldn't change my uh, background for this, so it is what it is. Uh, so <laughs> it's taken from the uh, Google Docs uh, template or whatever. So uh, okay, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about RR. It's uh, basically a uh, mocking framework that you can use. Um, so the reasons why I think you should use it over other frameworks, and I'm, I will be honest, I haven't used a lot of the other ones very much, but I think that this one's better um, because of ignorance is bliss, I guess. But uh, one, one thing that I really like about it is it has really terse syntax. Um, you don't need to kind of say, all right, I'm going to set this thing up, and then I'm going to do the, the do whatever action, and then I'm going to verify that that action happened. There's, there's, there are easier ways to do that. Um, which some other frameworks have, and then also I think it's closer to kind of the test doubles, um, like vocabulary or whatever, which is kind of like used by a lot of XP or you know agile kind of people. And like basically, it's saying there's not just mocking and subbing. There's like a lot of different kind of um, different ways of using test doubles, which are just okay. Um, how, how can I pretend that something is returning a value, or how can I inspect the contents of something that I'm calling an action on? So. Does everybody feel pretty comfortable with like just mocking and subbing in general, or do I need like discuss that more? I guess. Um, so okay, so at the very bottom is kind of like how you would say something in RR. Basically, <coughs> on the user class, I'm going to call the static method find with a parameter 42, and it's going to return to me the Jane object, which I guess I've instantiated earlier. Um, if you look at the top, it's kind of like you know a, another kind of mocking framework. How you might how you might say that. So it feels like it's a lot longer. Um, and so you know, kind of going down, there might be certain shortcuts that you could use in certain frameworks. But generally, I really like the terseness, conciseness of the, the way that you say that. Yeah, it's awesome. Sold. Okay, sweet. <laughs> Slide over. Exciting. That's it. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. And so it does it through some sort of Ruby magic, which if you, let, let's say you um, didn't have Jane defined or something like that, it would say something like, uh, method missing, this feature will not be implement, implemented until Ruby 193, consult your manual, and all this like, stuff like that. It's just like, whoa, uh, what happened? So you have to kind of, you know, just... If you get a weird error, just kind of think, okay, what am I doing wrong here? Um, which I guess is always true. But um, so one thing that uh, R has is the the difference between mocking and stubbing. So if I say stub user find 42 return Jane, that means that if user dot find is called with the parameter 42, then I'll return that. Um, if you say mock user dot find 42 Jane, then it assumes that it will be called, and if it's not called by the end of your test method, then it'll throw an exception saying, I expected user, dot find, user to be called with the find method with the parameter 42. Um, so it's basically just a way of saying, this method must be called. And there are ways that you can um, kind of, so, so it kind of, there's between subbing and mocking. Subbing says, if you happen to call this, just fill it out with this value. Mocking says, you must call it. So, um, all right, so this is kind of verbose, but whenever you, create um, an RR object, you then can inspect whatever gets called on it. So let's say I create a new subject object and I say stub the foo method on it. So not only can I say, whenever I call the foo method, I can do that and so I can also say should have received this method and I could say I should have received any other method. So basically it puts a listener on there to say, um, so I can inspect what is going on in the inside of it. Um, and then if I, you know, should have received bar, it didn't receive bar, and so that assertion would fail or whatever. Um, so this is just a way of kind of looking inside of your objects if you want to. I would say I, I pretty rarely use this actually, but it's something that's there. Um, so, and then one thing that I really like is that you have pretty flexible parameters. Um, so if you're not exactly sure what will be called or you want to just kind of say a general thing, so you could say um, call the foobar method with any string containing on. So, you know, I can. Uh, have several different methods use the same mock at the very beginning because they'll use some sort of you know different things with on. Um, I can say a number in the range from 1 to 10. Uh, one thing I really like is hash including so I don't care what all the other parameters are if you say say you're uh, testing like a controller method and you want to you know pass in to another method uh, this hash but you really don't care about one or two parameters of it then you just say hash including that and then you have to worry about like setting up the other eight parameters so Kind of gets back to what Kyle was saying with the, you know, make sure you focus on what actually matters in your test versus having to set up eight or nine things that don't actually matter. Um, and then also you can say um, 
I want, I want this th certain thing to be called a certain amount of times. Um, so you can say times one, times three. Uh, one, one problem is if you say any times, that could mean zero or more times, which means that it won't actually get called if you're like, so mock, right, remember it expects um, that it will be called at least once, right? But if you say times, any times, then it's going to say, oh, it wasn't called at all, but you said any times, so not a big deal. So I had a few things that, I was like, why isn't this failing? And then I figured it out. So, so now I have a times at least once matcher kind of thing. So, um, um, okay, so... So I am working on a project which uh, does stuff with like Groupon and stuff like that. And so I figured, okay, I'll pull some actual examples. I feel, I feel like uh, production code actually has like very little value outside of the system. So I feel comfortable showing this and apparently publishing it on the internet. So uh, anyway, so, so this is like real code here. So it's kind of exciting. Um, so this is a very basic example. Um, so when I hit the show method, it should return the points for the user. This is like a JSON API, basically. Um, so the iPhone goes and hits this thing, and then it wants to know how many points does this user have. Um, so I go ahead and set up my user object. Uh, the new iPhone user is a helper method I created. Um, I say, whenever this user gets the points method called on it, I want to return 99. So log in as a user, get the show method, and then what I get back as a result should be points 99. So instead of me having to uh, worry about you know how many points do they have and creating uh, different points objects and all this other kind of stuff like that, I can just say, look, just pretend that this user has 99 points and what is my result? So I like that metaphor of saying, let's pretend this happens, then what is the result of that? Um, so kind of another thing I like to do is, um, it's almost kind of like proof by induction a lot of times. So it's like, uh, I'll start at kind of the lowest case and make sure that that works and then Going forward, like let's say method A uses method B, um, which then use, uses method C up here. So it's like uh, if I test method A well, then when I use method B, which which uses A, then I can just say I can mock method A because I assume that it works for you know whatever cases that I've done. So I would have already tested the inputs and the outputs of A to make sure that it specifies or it conforms to a certain contract, and then basically you just kind of move up the chain. So. Uh, when you get to the very highest level, you can say, look, pretend that all this stuff below me works and that I'm just getting back this input so that you can decouple certain parts of your system from other parts. Um, it could blow up horribly in that, you know, if you're not sure what are the parts and the interfaces and everything like that, you know, you're, you're returning something, you're like, oh yeah, this, this works perfectly, but you realize like this whole module doesn't actually exist or something like that, you're just stubbing it or whatever, so, or mocking it. So that, that could be a big problem, but, uh, yeah, I don't know, so that's just kind of how I do it. Um, so I realize this is kind of a bad example once I was giving it earlier, but uh, basically, you know, I'm saying how can I set the set the time right now? So I'm using some sort of uh, stubbing for that, and then later on I'll say I want the group on division fetcher to run whenever it's you know three o'clock p.m. local time, and whenever I run the cron dot run method, which is this kind of goes back to the whole um, you know create a create a class which you can wrap your rake tasks in or whatever, or you know, your rake task calls a class that you were created. Um, there are definitely better ways to do this, but this is just like real code that I used that I thought was interesting. So, um, so in this one, basically I want to fetch Groupons once and then, um, you know, kind of get, get what I have there and then do it again, but in this case, there's no, there's no division return, so I should mark them all as inactive. This is just kind of like some logic that I use randomly. Um, and then, so the count should be six, and then all the actives should be false, that sort of thing. So instead of actually having to hit this service, I can just mock it and say, look, pretend like the Groupon gave me these things back, what should I do as a result of that? So um, basically, a lot of times when I interface with third-party services, I just, um, I don't actually want to hit them. In this case, Groupon has like an API limit, so if I were to run my test continually, then I might violate that in some way. So wouldn't want to do that to irritate them. Um, so. I would, I would use this also like if I was using like say interfacing with Active Directory or something like that, like uh, OLAP or something like that. I think that's the right word. Anyway, um, so kind of a similar thing here. Basically, th this, is, this is a lot of stubbing and mocking, but I'm basically testing when I call this fetch all, what actually happens here, and if so, what happens. Um, I also have like uh, where it says. The, the, very first, the very first line there, the stub URL fetcher, that fetch group on, so that calls something that which calls fetch, and at some point I say, 
if I'm trying to fetch an actual URL in the test environment, then I should throw raise some sort of exception. So basically, I don't ever actually want to hit anything externally. Um, like I said, there's probably better ways to do that. But um, so that way, if I accidentally don't stub this method out, then I will uh, get an exception, which is kind of what I want to get when I'm in the test environment. Um, so this is kind of a more complex example. I don't know if I want to go into it really. But, um, but basically, um, deal implements attachment helper as a module or whatever. It, it extends it. It's, I don't know what the right nomenclature is for that. but um, And then I can use the methods on that. And so I just want to test at a certain point that I call the add only new attachments with these certain parameters, which I d defined earlier in the wrapper um, thing. So um, just whenever I create a deal, I add any attachments that are necessary, that sort of thing. Um, so this is one of my favorite ones. This is not anything to do with RR, but I basically, um, in, if you use RSpec, if you don't have underscore spec, or uh, yeah, but like the file name underscore spec dot RB as your spec name, then it won't actually get automatically run if you use like auto test or something like that. So I created a spec that would look through and find any violations of this name, naming convention so that you could, you know, then it would say, hey, uh, you have a test that won't get run if you're using auto test. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Because I really got annoyed like three or four times when I would rename it the wrong way or something like that. And, ah, uh, why is this running? So, um, so the original source or kind of the version that I use is right up there. So you can check it out. Um, it's a lot shorter, obviously. So, let's see. If I can go so, all right. So, uh, I guess what questions do you guys have? I've used this on like, like a project and a half, maybe, or something like that. So. So I, and I feel like there haven't been really any, any real big hurdles or anything like that. It's just kind of a matter of, you know, there's not as many good examples as maybe there are in some other frameworks. But I feel like, uh, let's see if I can. stuff on that and the different, you know, how do you set up the test unit R spec? Uh, and then just kind of, this is the exact example that I gave. Um, so anyway, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of pretty good examples in here. So it's kind of interesting. Um, I mean, not really. I, I like just because I'm done, you know, at times, like, just, oh, why isn't this working? And then figure it out. So, standard problems ratio WTFs per minute was constant, I guess. So, all right, cool. Thanks. Thank you.